Before we start talking about how to solve differential equations, I want to talk about how we can do some approximate solutions, that is, give us an idea of what the solution should look like without actually having to go through and solving it. We're going to be doing this with direction or slope fields. They're called both direction fields and slope fields in various literature. Let's go back to our logistic modeling, that is the population growth with maximum capacity. Again, this is one of the equations I've asked you to memorize. Here's the equation again. You'll sometimes see it in this form, but of course that's just combining the two fractions inside the 1 minus p over k factor. Let's give some real numbers. In order to do some estimation, we're going to have to actually have some values for r and k. Let's let r equal 0.2 and k equal 10. We're going to let t go from 0 to 100, and we're going to look at p-values from negative 4 to 12. So let's rewrite this equation, and now I'm going to use prime notation. So if we remember that p prime is just the first derivative, or the slope of the function, what I could do is pick various values of p and see what the slope looks like at that particular value. Let's look at when p equals 0 and t equals 0. When p is equal to 0, p prime just ends up being 0. Notice I went through and said that t equals 0, but this is actually an autonomous equation. This is actually an autonomous differential equation like we said before, which means it doesn't matter what my value for t is. Anytime p is equal to 0, that is, anytime the population is 0, p prime, that is the rate of change of population, is also 0. And that makes intuitive sense. If you have no population, it's not going to be able to increase or decrease. Remember, what we're trying to do is find a solution curve for p. What function p makes this equation true? And what I'm going to do is anywhere p is equal to 0, I know the slope is 0. So I'm drawing these little tiny lines. These are called lineal elements to show that anywhere along that line, p equals 0, my slope is 0. And again, because this is an autonomous equation, it doesn't matter what my value for t is. Let's look at what happens when p is equal to 1. In that case, p prime is equal to 0 0.2 times 1 times 1 minus 1 divided by 10. And this is equal to 0 0.18. If I looked at p is equal to 2, we find that the slope would be equal to 0.32. If I looked at p equals negative 2, then I find the slope is equal to negative 0.48. Now I'm not very good at sketching these, but let's see if I can do that. So we'd have a slightly positive slope at p is equal to 1. At p equals 2, we'd have a slightly higher positive slope. And at p equals negative 2, we're going to have a negative slope. And this is called drawing a direction field. As you can tell, this is pretty tedious to do by hand. I'll only have you do one of these by hand. The rest I'm going to have you use a piece of software called dfield. To get to dfield, what you'll do is go to your Blackboard site and click on textbook and web links. From there you'll see dfield and pplane. And that'll bring you to this website. If you click on dfield jar, save it, and then run it, I'm using Chrome, that seems to work fairly well, then the software will pop up. What you're going to do is, in this main window, fill in the equation that we're trying to look at. Let's look at the logistic equation that we were just talking about. All right, so what I've done is I've typed in our equation. p prime equals 0.2p times 1 minus p over 10, and the independent variable I've declared is t. The parameter expressions were left over from the previous example. I'm not going to bother clearing those out. And I wanted my t to go from 0 to 100, and I wanted my p to go from negative 4 to 12. Now we're going to click on graph phase plane, and here you can see some of the slopes that I came up with before. Slope of around 0 at 0. And if you go up to 10, you also notice another place where the slopes are all 0. And that's because if 
p is equal to 10, then my equation has 1 minus p over 10 in it. 1 minus 10 over 10 is 1 minus 1 or 0, and that's why the slope is 0 at that point. So this is a direction field, also called a slope field. What you can also do with D field is say, all right, say I started at time equal 10 and a population of 2. What happens to my solution? If I click, this is a specific initial condition now, and now I'm looking at a particular solution, you can see that the population increases until it hits 10 and then it levels off. What happens if I start with a negative population? That really doesn't make any sense. It just gets merely more negative. That's really not a valid solution if I was talking about a real population. But if I started with a population of 12, say, and I'll start at time 10, you see that that population then decreases to the next point 10. And again, this is a special kind of differential equation. It's an autonomous differential equation. That is, the slopes are the same no matter what time is. And if I click on a lot of initial conditions, you can kind of get a feel for what the solution curves look like. These are all valid solutions from this differential equation. As soon as I click on a point, that gives me a particular solution, but the entire family of curves would be the general solution. This gives us a really good chance to talk about some special features of autonomous equations. If you notice, there's two points that everything either seems to be drawn to or go away from, and that's at the point 10 and 0. At 0, everything seems to zip away from that point. And the point 10, everything seems to be attracted to that point. These are called critical points. They're also called equilibrium points. There's a couple of different names for these. And we can evaluate these without relying on D field if I'm dealing with an autonomous equation. So I'll put a note in the notes that um, to see the complete direction field, you should use D field. So if I have autonomous ODEs, and we're only dealing with the first order ones at this point because the first derivative is the slope, I can draw what's called a phase portrait, which is much easier than drawing a direction field or a slope field. What we're looking for are critical points. They're also called equilibrium points, and they're also called stationary points. These critical points are when the slope equals zero. Let's remind us of the equation that I'm dealing with right now p prime is equal to 0.2p times 1 minus p over 10. So what I want to do is find when the slope is equal to 0. That is, I'm going to set p prime equal to 0. Of course, I can divide both sides by 0, and I've been nice. This is already in factored form. And then I'm going to use a zero factor property, and that tells me that this is equal to 0. The right-hand side is equal to 0 when two things happen when p is equal to 0 or 1 minus p over 10 is equal to 0. And I'm going to solve for p in both of these cases. Well, the left-hand side is already done. The right-hand side with a little bit of algebra, we find that the next critical point is 10. And it's much easier if we put these critical points on a vertical axis. So here's my first critical point, 0, and my second critical point is 10. What we're going to do is look at these three separate regions. That is when p is greater than 10, when p is between 0 and 10, when p is less than 0. Anywhere in that area, between the critical points, the sign of the slope, S-I-G-N, of the slope is going to be the same. So all I need to do is pick three test points. They can be anything, but I'm going to pick 11, 1, and negative 1. What I'm going to do for the test points is let p equal that value and see what the sign of the slope is. I don't really care what the number is, but just looking at this, I can tell this is going to be a negative value. So that means I'm going to put a downward arrow in that green region, that is where p is greater than 10. We can't ever use the equilibrium points themselves. We either have to go above or below those points. When p is equal to 1, let's look at what p prime is. In this case, I have a positive value. Again, I don't really care what the number is. I just know it's positive, which means I'm going to have an increasing slope in that region. 
Finally, if I look at when p is equal to negative 1, I find that I get a negative number. This is called a phase portrait. A phase portrait has two things. It has my critical points and it has arrows. And those arrows determine the direction of the slope in that region. I'm going to go ahead and paste it down here so I can show you how from this phase portrait I can draw solution curves. I'm going to put dotted lines where my critical points are. I know that I can never cross critical points. So that means in this blue region, if I have a positive slope, the only way to draw it is something sort of like that. In the green region, if I have a negative slope, it means it's going to get really close to that critical point but never cross it. And in the purple region, if I have a negative slope, this is going to be the only way I can draw it which looks remarkably like the D field drawing that we came up with. So again, I could draw that direct direction field, I could use a piece of software like D field, or if it's an autonomous equation, then I can just simply draw a phase portrait. This is something that you will be asked to do on the midterm. If I have two arrows going towards a critical point, like I do at 10, that's called an attractor. It's also called a stable critical point. If I have, however, two arrows going away from a point like I do at zero, then that's called a repeller or an unstable critical point. I also could get a situation where I don't have both arrows coming in or going out of a point. Let's take this differential equation. Again, this is autonomous because there's no independent variable. And what I have is a repeated critical point. And that's at the point y equals 1. Again, what I did is I set y prime equal to 0, and then I went ahead and solved for when this is true, and this is true when y is equal to 1. So I have a single critical point. So what I'll do is I'll take a test point at 2 and a test point at 0. When y is 2, y prime is equal to 2 minus 1 or 1 squared, or a positive value. When y is equal to 0, y prime is equal to negative 1 squared, which is still positive. So this point is called semi-stable. If the y value is below that critical point, it's drawn to the critical point. If it's above the critical point, it goes away from that critical point. If I wanted to draw the solution curve, it would look like that. Let me give one more example, and I believe you have a homework problem similar to this. In this case, if I'm trying to find when the first derivative is equal to 0, I actually have an infinite number of points that make that true. When y is equal to 0, or pi, or 2 pi, or negative pi, sine of that value is equal to 0. So what this phase portrait would look like is something like this. I'm not going to go ahead and type in the test points. I'm sure you guys can handle that. But if I wanted to draw what the solution curves look like, it would look like that. And it would, again, repeat indefinitely. These phase portraits and solution curves only work, however, if I'm dealing with an autonomous equation. If instead I was looking at something such as y prime equals xy, what I'm going to have to do is draw my direction field or use something like d field. So I've typed this into D field. Again, I have y prime equals xy with the independent variable being x. And my minimum x and maximum x and my minimum y and maximum y, I've set at negative 3 to positive 3. If I go ahead and graph that, then I see a very different picture than I did when I was dealing with autonomous. You notice that depending on what my t value is, the slope is actually changing. We are actually going to be able to solve this type differential equation. In fact, we'll be doing that the very next lecture. But even without knowing what the solution is, we can get an idea of what the shape of the solution is given our values for x and y. Again, each of those blue lines, that's a particular solution based on a specific initial condition. The initial conditions are those little tiny blue circles. But next, we're going to learn how to actually solve differential equations.